you are listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. Coming to you virtually live from high atop the historic Raleigh building in beautiful downtown Raleigh. The NCF&B takes the listener behind the scenes to tell the stories of the people that contribute to the creation of the food and beverage community of North Carolina. And now, the misfits in the dish pit, the faces of the front. They are Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hello, and thank you for listening to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. I am your co-host, Max Trujillo. And I am your co-host, Matthew Weiss, and we have a packed show for you today. We're going to talk wine, wine education, cooking, writing about cooking. We're going to talk about coffee. We're going to talk about bubbles. We're going to talk about brisket. We're going to talk about, I feel like Crazy Eddie right now. Yeah, geez, act now. (laughs) Exactly. Buy it now. Um, But to help us unpack all this and talk about all this is one... uh, "Quote unquote celebrity chef and now wine educator, as she brought Vitis House to Raleigh, won Doreen Colondres. Woohoo! I'm so excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. All right. I don't know if that energy is up so high because of all the caffeine that we just gave you. <laughs> I think so. The coffee, the coffee is awesome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. You said it, not us. But uh, and welcome uh, a new sponsor to the show, Joe Van Gogh. Yeah, coming out of Hillsboro." We uh, so we're starting a, a great little partnership with Joe Van Gogh, who makes delicious coffee. They're not just a coffee house; they're also roasters. They have seven coffee cafes all over North Carolina, so it made so much sense to work with them. Mainly too, because Matt and I are huge coffee snobs. Mm-hmm. I did t- as we were talking to everybody over there at Joe Van Gogh. I was like, "Yeah, we would love it, and we'd love to start off drinking some coffee in the podcast. It would be great." Al- although all we have is this really lousy drip coffee machine at the kitchen. Well, we do have, actually, we have a French press. That's pretty cool, too. But uh, rest assured, she, they, she was like, let's just get, uh, let's just hook you up. So we have this beautiful new Chemex. Mm-hmm. We have a coffee grinder. Yeah. We have a, a gooseneck uh, pourer or whatever you call that deal. And uh, and we've been making coffee pour over style all morning long, and it is ridiculous. We just poured it in our co- cup. What are we drinking? Yeah, this is delicious. So this is their Mountains to Sea blend, and it raises money for the Mountains to Sea Trail, which you can check out on mountains to sea trail.org. And that trail stretches 1,175 miles from the Great Smoky Mountains to the Outer Banks. And of course, it goes along many of our beautiful places along the way. Uh, they launched this blend in 2017, and they've released it every summer since then. So, and I don't know if you're tasting this. You're a good taster being now a wine professional as well, but it has some candied apples, some milk chocolate, and even like a little citrusy lemonade thing going on. It's it's pretty special. It's pretty special. And it has a combination of like bold, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's smooth. Yeah, and creamy it's too. Really nice. Yeah, that it's milk really chocolate nice. thing. So, Cheers. Yeah. What a treat. <laughs> uh, you can buy this online at joevangogh.com. That's Joe, V A N G O G H.com or in their cafes in Raleigh. Yeah. But welcome, Joe Van Gogh. We love you guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. But Chef Doreen, you've come onto the scene like in a big splash into North Carolina. Forgive me that uh, leading up to maybe the last six months, I was like, I kind of heard this woman's name. And then I looked everywhere and you you were all over the place, whether you were gracing the cover of a local magazine or inside another magazine or doing TV spots over here. You've released books, both in Espanol and in English. Like, you're you're everywhere. Uh, let's let's get into it. Let's. <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. What, who are from you? From a little island surrounded by water called yeah. Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, where uh, you you're what everybody in Puerto Rico gets to vote but doesn't have any representation. Is that right? Is that what we've done here, America? Well, well uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers for the coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Lived there, um, and and my first round of um, studies, I, I did it there, and then I moved to Miami. Lived in Miami for 17 years. Lived in Spain two years. Lived quite some time in Argentina because of work. Um, I come from a family of cooks, and it's yeah. like I don't know. It, it, I don't know what happened. It was kind of like an accident. Like my grandpa was a professional cook and my other grandpas from my mom's side, we used to have like 30 different ingredients in the backyard. And while my sister was watching TV and playing with the Barbies, I was just in the kitchen. And, and like with I your parents, started, with your grandparents? Yes, I mean, I started cooking when I was nine and it was my, 
absolutely everything. Never thought it was going to end up being my career. Um, but it was, for me, it was everything. It was like a, a way of help my parents because they were very um, workaholic um, or hard workers, let's say. Sure. And um, also st stress, I mean, relief for me and, and a way to connect I think food is energy, food is everything, and, and we are what we eat. And it's so important. Also, it connects us each other. I mean, we start talking about food and we can, and we will never stop, you know? It's yeah. like when we have a passion, we have a passion. But you did something that most chefs don't do. Uh, you have this passion for the kitchen, you're doing all this cooking, but then you also took a heavy interest in wine as well, which you're sitting in a room with two nerds about wine. We take that very serious as well, and that's pretty cool that you were able to extend your knowledge uh, and even and and more so like we know a lot of chefs that do know a lot about wine, but you're like you're public about your knowledge about it so much so that you opened up a place, a brick and mortar that teaches about wine and uh, and and really like is a cornerstone of kind of like who you are, like your brand, if you will. Uh, which is bold, which is pretty awesome, too, because both sides of the coin are really hard to understand uh, in its own right. But then to be able to kind of do both is uh, it's uh, that's a lot. That's a big task. I will call it an accident. Um, my, <laughs> in my family, they used to drink whiskey or beer. And um, and then one day I became a fan of wine, but I'm also a nerd. I love education. So I was like, if I'm going to get into wine, I need to study about wine because I don't know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't know anything. Yeah. So I started studying and um, it, it became a drug. I mean, I don't like to use that name, but it became a drug for me. It was like the more you know, the more you want to learn. So it was totally an accident. Then um, when I started this career that I was like having cooking shows and doing all this thing around the world, I ended up working for five years with Fox um, channels and the studios were in Argentina. So I was like, every free day I was like going to Mendoza. So it was kind of like an accident. And then I started working with the government of Spain um, to promote their food and their wines. And I yeah. ended up living there and I became, I don't know, addicted to it. <laughs> it yeah, like, so, it's a perfect marriage. Yeah, well, it, it is. And I want to get into that more about like, how come there's a lot of chefs that you can taste with, they don't necessarily know a lot about wine but then they taste it and they understand the flavors just at the very basic level which is always amazing to me i mean it makes sense because you you, you know you're schooled in taste but 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 then they don't like necessarily drink wine or love it it's just they understand it which is pretty amazing i know there's not a question in there but my question for you is before you even got to wine you start you you really got or cut your teeth in writing books right that's where you kind of got your notoriety your as a said quote unquote celebrity status right you wrote this this book called uh, the kitchen ne, no muerde yeah the kitchen doesn't bite oh and you have a copy <laughs> look at that there it is I love it for you guys um, thank um, you yes i mean i started um, my first brand that i work with i think it was um, general meals and i started doing cooking shows for them in national tv and then it became like what were you cooking cheerios uh, <laughs> Hey, what are you actually with? getting oh, out of the <laughs> like I don't know like reinventing um, re doing recipes that people are not expecting to do like okay. cooking with yogurt and cooking they have different brands um, and um, it, it was it was pretty awesome um, and after that I started working with different brands and different brands and more brands and more brands and then I think the food and wine um, uh, consortios from all over the world they saw that I was like s starving <laughs> of like um, yeah. educating myself and then I ended like studying in, in Israel and in Italy and in different parts of the world um, mm -hmm. about food and wine and it was a nice way to connect with people because people were like I don't know people from Venezuela they were like oh my god the 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 dessert that you make tastes like my grandma is like that's very powerful because I mean I don't know her grandma and I'm not from Venezuela yeah. and that's how I do it with like different I do it with respect when I put together a recipe I do it with respect and and I try to protect also traditions and food and wine brings you a story it is an ingredient. It, it's, it's always a, a, a memory or, or childhood memory or something. There's always something that brings you like, yeah. I don't know, touch your heart. So um, yeah. so when you first wrote the book, is that you're saying that that was the ingredients that you were really honoring and that's why it was so impactful? Like what was the key to success for writing that, that book and why did it become an Amazon bestseller right away? 
I think it was because of the fusion of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. I present you an, uh, a recipe there, and I can give you 10 other options of making oh, that recipe. I like, I like to that. challenge people. Mm. What if you can't find that chili? Yeah. What if you can't find that spicy? Right? What if one ingredient you don't like and you want to substitute that? So I like to challenge people because people are afraid of cooking to such a big level that they're afraid of buying a brand new ingredient in the grocery store. People go to the grocery store and they buy the same thing every week. I and know. I tell people, come on. And it's exactly with wine. Yeah. It's like, come on. There's thousands of great varieties in the world. It's like one life is not enough to taste all the wines in the world. Taste something new every day. Come on. <laughs> Creatures of habit. Yeah. It's like, don't buy the same chicken. Don't cook the same steak. I and know. Felicia and I had this conversation about like uh, getting a buying a beach house not like we're gonna do this or like it's the thought of buying a beach house i was like that sounds cool but that means that you're always vacationing at that beach house mm. and i would rather travel the world and like whatever money <laughs> i was going to spend on that beach house use it to go see a new beach house every single time keep trying new experiences i can't go back to the same thing so maybe like yeah sitting at your beach house every weekend is like buying that bottle of rombauer every weekend and just drinking that chardonnay all the time i mean it's not for me. I'm not saying it's wrong. If you love that Chardonnay and you're like, that's my jam, then fine. That, yeah. Go with it. But Drink I want to try or... different things. But I don't sure. want to do that. I want to do new things all the time. No, but it, I think this is more akin to, I remember you telling a story, and I think you've told it a couple times on the, on the podcast, is when we were lo in lockdown and you could only go to the grocery store, you guys were finding yourself buying the same thing every week, every week, every week. And then you're like, you know what? Let's go to someplace different. And you went to like the H Martyrs, like yeah. to get all Asian food and yeah. you cook completely different. And we would go to the Latin stores as well. I'd like just be like, okay, if we're going to have taco night, let's not do Trader Joe's taco night. Yeah. Let's go to an actual market and get the more authentic ingredients. And then more importantly, not just have it for that night, but like buy more. Um, uh, like fundamental ingredients, like different types of flours, different types of sugars, different types of vinegars, so that now they're in our uh, pantry for the next few weeks. Like that's now what the flavors that we're going to be cooking with for a while. So it changes your, yeah. your menu. And I don't know if it happens to you during the pandemic, but I catch myself cooking those recipes that I was never cooking. That I, I mean, grandma's or my mom's recipe. And I was like, oh, my God. I <laughs> And was it great? Yeah, they okay. were great, but they were not my kind of like mm, standard your, ones, yeah. you know? It was not like I think I was missing those comfort food um, recipes. Yeah, you have to break out of your, like you say. Well, I have a, I have a very specific question for you, and, and then we'll head even more down the path into wine. But um, So I love to make... Uh, like chicken wings or drumsticks, but I don't like all the fried stuff or the, you know, the flour. So like, is there something that I can use that's not glutinous or very high in like carbohydrates to make that chicken get crispy? Or is there just a way? I mean, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm wondering if you have a suggestion there. Um, are you planning on frying them or bake them? Well, pro I can do either. I have an air fryer. I can bake them in the oven. Oh I can God. put them on the grill. I can put them on the smoker. Well, sounds like you already have your own answer then. You, you, yes. There you go. Well, I'm just asking what's the best, you know? I don't know. If I, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like last night, I just put some in the oven. Yeah. And I just made it with some um, honey and a crazy amount of pepper and lemon juice see honey i didn't and even think to do that so yeah. honey probably helps because it caramelizes. yes it caramelizes the top mm -hmm. and it will make it crunchy mm. you can even i don't like to add this but there's people that will add a little bit of um Panko? Uh, brown sugar okay oh yeah and that will help a lot i don't mm -hmm. like to add sugar i mean we don't need excess i i'm all about balance <laughs> right i'll add some sugar Just <laughs> <laughs> that's great that was uh scott james what he famously over when i was at midtown grill did the espresso rubbed mm -hmm. steak that everyone went and john on for like for years and right years. that and he couldn't he ever left, take off the menu yeah he could never change it and then when he left to go work at angus barn the chefs after him were always tasked by the owners to like replace you know 
do the same rub. And they could never do it right because they're like, I'll do my version. I'll do my version. And these guys were smart. They knew what they were doing, but they also didn't want to do exactly what Scott did. And one time I just broke down and called him like, Scott, how, what are they doing wrong? Like, what's up? He's like, bro, it's the turbinado sugar. Just you got to put way more in it than you think. It's a espresso rub. Sure. But really, it's a sugar rub. Steak. <laughs> I'm like, OK. He's like, so that of, gets a crispy probably, yeah, right? Chili powder, like, espresso and the turbinado sugar, the brown sugar and throw it in there. And then you're just coating the entire ribeye on there and throwing it on the grill. Tons of salt, tons uh-huh. of pepper, like whatever. Uh, I would laugh watching those guys salt a steak. I didn't realize, like, at that time, I was so, like, naive. Like, I didn't realize that's how much salt and pepper you put on a steak when you're actually doing it for real. And as I've said before, Calicchio says in the uh, that Playboy article he wrote about making a steak, he goes, by the way, if you read what I'm going to say about making the steak and the amount of sugar or the amount of salt and pepper I'm going to put on and you decide not to do that, stop reading right now because you're not going to, like, this is not the recipe for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Like, if you're going to do it, you got to just do it. Like I mean, I worked at, at a steakhouse, so yeah, I know very well <laughs> the mm-hmm. amounts of salt. Big old like pats of butter, just slap. Oh it on yeah, top. and it's major D butter, so it's not like oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not your... I'm not listening now. <laughs> Well, actually, that's a good segue because your food and your kind of messaging with your food, whether it's in Spanish or in English, is to also cook with a, a, a little bit of health to you, right? That's that's an important aspect of your cook cookbook or your cooking style is to not just be like what Matt and I just said. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that, and maybe is that like cheating a little bit to like just say let's just throw a bunch of salt, butter, and you know bacon on something and solve all the problems? You know what is? I'm not gonna lie. I love to eat. Uh, have a little piggy inside of me, and it's really big. Um, <laughs> but I realize I'm I'm eating now more than before, and I will say that is like the more you control everything, like cooking at home. It makes a big difference. Yes, we love restaurants. We we support restaurants, but eating, cooking at home makes a big difference. Yeah, and cooking from scratch. We don't control what we eat when we go to a restaurant. Right, but yeah. we can control it and get into that bold, delicious flavor from home without adding like a crazy amount of bacon, a crazy amount of butter, a crazy amount of of heavy cream, a crazy amount of preservatives or salt so it makes a big difference and i'm i'm very proud i've been working with um with a pharmaceutical company as a spokesperson um on a, as an ambassador for obesity and diabetes for the past six seven years yeah that's how i ended in north carolina i was doing a cooking show for the employees of the city of raleigh and i, I was like ah, i like the air of this city i yeah. think i can live here yeah, well, thanks for a- and a- four answering months, that question. Was, four months later, yeah. it happened. <laughs> you were here. Well, and actually, that's a perfect segue because, you know, to talk, start talking about wine and, and what you're doing in Raleigh specifically, uh, w- when you go to a restaurant, you kind of have to make an impression, right? You want people to come back. So you want to cook with the heavy cream, the lots of salt, lots of flavor. And it's kind of like when you think about wine reviews, right? That They always said, like, especially as Robert Parker arguably the most influential wine critic in the history of wine reviews, uh, used used to be as he got older and his palate maybe got fatigued. Well, what stands out most when you're tasting 500 to 1,000 wines in the day, the ones that are plush and full of fruit and full of alcohol, because those are going to make the most impression on your palate. Yeah. They're not necessarily the best wines. Well, that's what a lot of Top Chef contestants say about the aforementioned Calicchio and Padma and all of them. They're like, oh, all, the only way to win is just overdo everything yeah like too salty too fatty too acidic if you do that you're gonna win you're gonna win because that's gonna make the impression because because basically they're saying the judging panel has been blown out like their palates have been blown out right from eating all this food all the time maybe they're a little bit right uh, who knows oh definitely but i think finally in the wine world and you can speak to this doreen you know we've I think we've shifted back. The pendulum has gone back to lean and, you know, wines that are made, like I always love to say, wines that are made in the vineyard, not in the winery. And so uh, has that kind of led you to start a school, a a wine education school? Was that part of uh, your thinking there? Yes. I mean, I I get obsessed with the same... the same thing that happened to me with the food in terms of the quality of the ingredients, it happens with the wine. When mm-hmm. people said, I don't drink wine because it caused me headaches. I was like, just spend more money in your wine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Stop buying cheap crap. It's like yeah. you're buying McDonald's wines in the pharmacy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, 
there's so much history and and story in a wine, and there's so much that we can learn. That is is very is very amazing. It's pretty amazing. And I tell people all the time, the best wine is the wine that you like. Mm-hmm. I can introduce you to whatever wine is. Oh my God, for me and and it's like I mean. Everyone is different. I a realize. wine is like a like a woman or a man in your life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, you, and that's actually it's a great way of saying it because like sometimes you're like I don't know why I'm so attracted to that person or whatever or or the flavors Same or whatever. Thing like you don't happen really in the wine. Get it? But like you really are. I I had this moment in um, in I guess we were in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, we went to this wine bar. They had a very tight wine list. It was like three reds, three whites, and a rosé. And it was a really hot day, and Felicia and I both ordered a white wine, which we typically don't do if a rosé is available. I'm like, oh, I'll get this. And it was a northern Italian white, which is already kind of in my alley of what I like. And it was a blend, and I tried it, and it just, oh, it was like everything I love about wine. It just felt right. I even texted you a picture, Matt. I'm like, can you get this? Where is this from? Who gets this? And you're like, oh, it's not in my book. I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and I asked the guy, and he told me, and I've forgotten, whatever, you know. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for a new love in my life, but that wine, I ended up buying three bottles and, and took it back home, and it, it was just perfect. By the way, that doesn't sound like my answer. I'm just going to say. You were like, oh, like, it's not in my book. I'm sure I could get, I'm sure <laughs> I could find that it. That sounds more of, like me. Eh, 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 whatever, okay. Who cares? The beauty is finding <laughs> so out. Okay. Hyperbolic story. <laughs> Which was that wine that blew your mind away? And then you look for the characteristics of that wine, and then you have a crazy amount of wines around the world yeah. with probably the same characteristics. Mm-hmm. So you can taste, you can start enjoying wines with the same profile. Right. And that's where you or your team come in because you're able to, at the Vitis House, like tell people, oh, I can explain to you why you like these wines. Because they're from here, uh, they source this way, or they're grown this way, or whatever. And then, yeah, from that point on, it doesn't always have to be that northern Italian wine. It could be a wine from uh, Croatia or, or, or Oregon or whatever. <laughs> but like, but they all are. These producers have this particular lilt to their style of making wine that will probably make you enjoy them a, a little bit more. True. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, we offer classes for everyone. Like if you want to do a certification, if you want to just have fun and understand the right way. Yeah. So you um, can explain to your people or yes. people who are buying wine for you or where you're going. Like, this is what I like. For example, this Friday we have a, no, this uh, Thursday we have a class that is called Wine 101 Classify Art. And it's like people that don't know anything about wine and they want to start learning. It's a two-hour class. But then the tasting is not going to be Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Grigio. For that, you just go to the bar or go to your place. Yeah. So you're going to taste rare wine. So rare mm. grapes. So you can open a brand new door yeah. <laughs> of flavors Expand and grapes. Yes. So we're going to ta- be tasting wines from, from Spain, from Croatia, from Portugal, from like rosés from Patagonia nice. and stuff like that. So that's, you know, and that's, uh, that's a product of, I feel like just the last 10 years, Matt, like we've talked about this too, that maybe it's just because communication, social media, the internet, whatever, accessibility to other styles of wine and understanding like new regions and or, or regions that have been around but maybe weren't popularized as much are now becoming more aware. Like we're, we're becoming more aware of these places. And now it's just like, sure, you can get you can kind of get wine anywhere. Like, mm-hmm. is it, like people are figuring out you can grow and make good wine all over the world, not just in those like eight cool places that we all looked for in the, in the past. Uh, I appreciate it. I do want to mention one thing before we talk about trying a wine company. A little solemn moment, a little little in the choke, uh, the back of the throat, a little sadness. Uh, but we have to honor Mr. Jim Clendenin, who, uh, uh, yeah. who passed. Uh, we're recording this a couple, like, a, like probably eight days or ten days before you hear this. So it's a little old news, but uh, Jim Clendenin of Ambal and Clément, a uh, fantastic winemaker, he, uh, he had a moment on our show. He came out here to North Carolina. We had him on the podcast. Uh, anyhow, cheers to you, Jim. Thanks for giving us uh, delicious wine over the years. Yeah, he really put the Central Coast on the map for oh, for a lot of people. So rest in peace, Jim. Yeah. But as we were talking about wine, we wanted to mention uh, the Triangle Wine Company, who has uh, been supporting the podcast for years now. They actually, maybe this is, a, maybe this is how we should mention uh, Bubbles and Brisket, Matt, because Triangle Wine Company has a lot to do with Bubbles and Brisket. Uh, we are actually doing an event, a specific event, called 
Bubbles and Brisket. It's going to be on June 26th. It's a Saturday. It's the last Saturday of June. It's uh, the weekend after Father's Day. So uh, if you forgot to do something cool for your dad or you want to get your dad a gift, get him a gift to get out of the house and go socialize with friends and hang out with people because, yay, we can do that again. And so uh, what we're talking about. Yeah. What is it? What's Bubbles and Brisket? That sounds awesome. I don't know. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. (laughs) Imagine if you will. You're in Cary at V Pizza, former guest of the show, Anthony Rapillo's V V Pizza, outside, multiple tents, multiple little areas with pit masters making their version of brisket paired perfectly, effortlessly, and effervescently with bubbles. We're talking champagne, we're talking cava, we're talking prosecco, we're talking all types of wine that is sparkling. Matt has been able to connect all of these amazing wine producers, even the the good Max, the other the yeah. one that everyone likes. Yeah, the master sommelier Max. Max Cast will be in attendance, helping to educate the community about these fantastic bubbles, as well as Matt Weiss. But we've got beautiful names on there, like Mark Russell of Longleaf Swine. We've got James Johnson uh, over at Skippers. We've got secretly one of the greatest pit masters that no one knows, Kyle Sutton. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to, for my Carrie Schleifer of Alley 26 in Crook's Corner is going to do a Jewish style brisket, which is one of the impetuses we had for Mm -hmm. this about like different brisket styles. And she's going to do it with carrots and uh, potatoes. And so like a little, and then Anthony of Via Pizza is going to do a brisket topped Neapolitan pizza, which is going to be wild. Oh my god! I think we're going to have some brisket tacos there. So it's going to be a soul. Yeah, so brisket tacos. Yeah, so it's going to be some different uh, iterations of brisket, not just your classic smoked brisket, but of course that's going to be there as well, and not just your classic pairing. Not just your classic pairing, which I love. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Make people think out of the box. Yeah, because wine. Wine should be enjoyed more often, and like that was kind of the the impetus of this whole thing. Is we love brisket. We love Matt was even saying it's like yeah, brisket's great. Let's be honest, you're probably just going to drink this with beer. That's probably the easiest way to do it. And say, like, but there are other ways. And so it's it's kind of what you're saying, Doreen. Like the same idea of taking people out of their comfort zone of their Pinot Grigios and their Cabernets and their Chardonnays. It's like yeah, those are all great. But if you find that there are other things that can work. Well, you should explore those ideas and, and get like a new flavor in your mouth, a new excitement. So champagne and brisket, come on. Yes, yeah. right. absolutely so, amazing. So this bubbles and brisket thing, how do I get how there? Do I get, how, how do I get a ticket? How do, <laughs> or do I get a ticket? What do I do? Yes, well, uh, the folks uh, at Raleigh Magazine, the folks at the Butcher's Market, the folks at Triangle Wine Company, and the folks that are speaking right now, the NCFMB podcast, who created it, are all working together to get you uh, these tickets. So you can go to our website, ncfbpodcast.com. It's a pop-up. As soon as you get there, it'll be the first thing you see. Buy tickets. If you get them now, up until June 1st, you save 10 bucks on a ticket. Ticket Tickets are $65, and uh, there will be live music as well, and uh, and also some other special guests. We don't want to give the whole thing away all at once, but there'll be some uh, surprise people that might join up with there that will really make it worthwhile for your time. Uh, but we did mention Triangle Wine Company at the the start of it, they are helping to provide uh, a lot of the champagne and the bubbles that are going to be there. Exactly. Because you can then, if you love them and you find that, oh, this is something else great, you can buy them from trying a wine company as well. That's the best. That's the best, right? You just fill out an order form. The next couple of days, you go and pick them up, deliver them to your house. Beautiful wines, beautiful food, beautiful people. Of course. I mean, Max is going to be there. So, you know, but uh, yeah, but it's still well worth it. A ton of food, a ton of drink, music, entertainment, and you get to see people. I mean, not, not, you know, you don't have to see me and Matt. You don't, you can look away when we're there. (laughs) Don't look, don't look at us, but, uh, but look at other people and hang out and enjoy yourselves because that really was why we wanted to do this. It's like, let's kick off. Let's, let's get back into public. Let's, let's hang out again. We kind of were one of the last things that, uh, here at the kitchen with the, the happy hour right before the, the pandemic shut everything down. So, uh, why not kind of kick it back off again? Um, we all need that. Yeah, we do. And with champagne and good food. Oh my. Right. I'm in. Okay. So back to you, Doreen. So, uh, you said a little bit about you know you you were here um, being uh, working with a pharmaceutical company, but then you decided to stay in Raleigh and literally open up shop as a as a wine school. So talk to us about why you. Why so a this few is the things. Place. I mean, I'm very passionate about education. I always dream about having my own cooking school and yes slash 
wine school. And it was funny. I was here on a Monday and I was in front of a wine store and I catch myself seeing people at lunchtime having some charcuterie and wine. Mm -hmm. And that blew my mind away. That only happens in like very California, European. in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I love the, I love the vibe of the people that people like to relax and enjoy life more than in other cities. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I think this is my place. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a WSET level three, and um, I got actually my results for level three while I was here. And I was like, this is a sign. Mm. Let me check if they are here in North Carolina. And they were not here. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start with that. Yeah. I'm going to bring WSET and Wine Scholar Guild. Um, they're both the most prestigious um, wine schools in the world. And uh, I was mm. like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it happen. And four months later, I was leaving here. And less than a year later, I, I opened um, Viti's house. Yeah. And it's really cool because it's a way for me to connect with people, too. And um, I like to treat them. And in some of the classes, I like to cook for them, depending on um, what the class is about. Like I have a Malbec and empanada class where I cook homemade empanadas paired with the wines or like romantic reds, which is wines from Red Bull, wines from Italy. I like to make like the traditional Bolognese from yeah. Bologna, which is very far from the Bolognese that we know here in America. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And um, like really nice charcuterie from um, different countries in Europe and all of that. So I think we have, I mean, I'm, I'm building like a full package of like food and wine, even on a new class that I just opened that is um, Ole Wine and Tapas, that is wines and food from Spain. People learn even about olive oils. I'm very passionate about olive oils and people have a chance to understand and appreciate more olive oils. So I mean, I think we have we have it all. It's really yeah. cool. So little by little, we offer level one, two, and three in wine for WSET. We offer the French Wine Scholar, which we're currently um, doing it. And we're bringing the Italian Wine Scholar, which is a master in Italy and Spain. Oh, cool. And um, what else? We, st we recently started WSET level one in spirits. Mm-hmm. We started uh, actually a class that it's called Tequila or Mezcal, and uh -huh. that was really popular. We, we did yeah. really good with that one. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, I'm very thrilled because I, I feel that I'm bringing something to the city, and it's like I'm very passionate. People that have been to classes, yeah. they know that I, I we give it all. No, definitely. And I, for one, I know uh, the point of validation that Brianna Needle is one of your teachers, and she's fantastic. She's, she's absolutely really absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, I used to work with her at the wine feed when she was there. And she left there to go work for you. So you, that, that says something or go work with you. But, uh, you know, what I was going to say is I think you really had your finger on the pulse because, you know, before that, if people wanted some sort of formal wine education in this city, uh, your only options really were to when the quartermaster sommelier would do their uh, uh, entry level at the Angus Barn sometimes. Right. And. That's quite a lot of money. It's like one weekend, and that's your only options. And then if you want to continue with that, you got to go fly somewhere and take the certified level, et cetera, et cetera. But this really gives you a great option right in downtown Raleigh, and there's an experiential wing to it as well. So Yeah, it's an easy for... one. Thank you. I mean, level one is only one full day. Level two is two full days, and level three is four and a half full days. I like to run all the courses like in an, the intensive way because it's a way for you to also unplug from your from your your daily life and just concentrate in the course and um, people are loving it. Yeah. I mean, so far so good. It's, it's really amazing. I have a question for you on a different level. Being, um, coming up as a chef and being a Latina woman, a Puerto Rican uh, descent, has that has, has, has that been a barrier for you in any uh, stretches? Um, I, I will say no. Okay. I will say no. I um, my first degree was in marketing. Okay. And when I started um, this journey, I kind of like explore other people in the same line of business. Yeah. And actually, education was the key to get respect in the industry. Meaning, if you were the educator, it, it, if or having education. having the, having an education. Okay. Yes, there's a lot of people in the industry that they work and they pretend and they thing that they know and they don't educate themselves. And I think that marked the key to get respect um, in such a heavy um, 
industry. Because when I started this 15, 17 years ago, there was not too many females, not even cooking on TV. Right. So it was a little bit hard because I think my concept was different. But um, but no, I think education education helped me. Yeah. You because were it was definitely. like... Yeah. <clears throat> I know my thing. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, and I like the, uh, I, I haven't done the WSET, at, well, I started it and I was like going through the program, but it was being funded by the company that I was leaving. So uh, it would be really bad taste to like still go with it while I quit to go work for another company. So I didn't finish the education on that side. Um, sounds like me in college in general. But uh, what I liked is the education that was coming from that practice really got deep into not just uh, tasting wine or like opening a bottle as if you were a sommelier at a restaurant, but kind of like the science of the wine and like how wine is made and why it's made a certain way and how it's different in a lot of other places. Uh, I know like going through some of like the preliminary stuff through the Court of Masters was a lot of, like to kind of help the person in the restaurant industry yeah. become a really good som, which if you're just a fan of wine and you want to learn more, that might be giving, giving you a lot of information that you don't need. It's like cluttering yes, it. Yes, the Court of Master is more service-oriented. Yeah. And that's why people that work in the winery or even in the vineyard, they like to do WSET. Yeah. And, I mean, if you're doing it for fun, I mean, it will help you a lot. And also, the Wine Scholar Guild is even deeper. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I... My favorite wines are from Spain. I lived in Spain two years. I've been yeah. drinking Spanish wines all over. When I was in front of that first class of Wine Scholar Guild, the Spanish master, I was like, uh, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the beauty of the industry. It's like, I mean, we can just learn something new every day. You know, it's really cool. You're a, uh, a public person, like a media person. You've been doing a lot of public-facing things, which uh, regardless of it being connected to food or wine, it's just its own thing in general. Matt and I, we're, we pretend to be that person a little bit because we do some public events every now and then, do some public speaking. But that also in itself is its own is its own type of person. Like you can know a lot about all these things we're talking about, but don't have the ability to convey it to the community and get out there. Like I love watching Matt do wine classes in front of people. Cause he actually, he knows what he's talking about and he says it concisely and like people can understand it. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's the, that's how you're supposed to do that. Um, but how did that, get kind of started for you i mean somebody i don't think you just yourself kind of say i need to be in front of a camera people <laughs> i need to do this so how did that come out of you like how did somebody kind of get you to be in front of the camera in front of a lot of people to speak i can show you pictures of me with three years old singing in stages <laughs> yeah okay so you've all I, been a performer your whole life yeah since i was little i was i always liked the media my first um, movie as an extra. <laughs> Don't get excited. Um, <laughs> I got it was like a hundred dollars a day, but I was like I don't know twelve. Yeah. yeah. Um, started my my first commercial was probably when I was like fifteen. It was like when Gatorade launched the brand all around the world. Um, so yes, I've been in front of cameras since I'm little. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely your... love it. And it's like I said, during his nights are in front of a camera. <laughs> Not in so if I we just, come to dinner with you, we have to have a camera going. Is that the? No, 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 no. If I'm cooking, you're gonna have fun. Okay. Okay. If I'm not cooking, <clears throat> I'm gonna ha I'm gonna be stressed out. <laughs> you know, I suffer from that a lot. Felicia sometimes hates going to dinner with me at places because, like, all I do is analyze the service. It's or really hard. Analyze everything. Like, I don't really analyze the food too much. I'm just more like, yeah, cool. Food's great, or the drinks are great. But I'm like critiquing everything that the server does. Or they could have done it this way. Oh, now they, they they put it on me. Now I feel uncomfortable because of the thing that just happened. Or oh, they, you could have uh, refilled that glass. Or you could have done this. Like. It's constant to the point where, like, we just had our anniversary, and Felicia's like, "Really? Just chill out. Who cares?" It's difficult to unplug. <laughs> it, yeah, I said to a, 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 we were hanging out at a pool, and I said to the, the, a lady that clearly worked there, "I said, um, is somebody, can I order from you? Can I order a beer?" She's like, "I'll get the person," and I went, "Oh, could I just 
Can I just you? tell you because you're gonna you work here? She's like, I'll get your guy. He'll be over in just a moment. I'm like, was it so hard to just say what do you want? I hazy IPA, sure, cool, and then tell the guy. So then now I've got to wait for you to walk over to the person, tell that person that I want something that he's got to walk over to me to do all that. Like people. Let's help the customer. You're basically like the born identity of restaurant <laughs> service. Like you are Jason Bourne when it's like you're seeing things, your brain is mm. is accessing information that like you're I mean, not that's even been conscious said of. So many times yeah. before. I, I, I get that all the time. But uh yeah, it's just like that. Except for uh I annoy people instead <laughs> of getting them out of They heart. just don't know what you know. Um <laughs> Doreen, so, okay, if uh, what, what do you say to people, like, or how do they find you? Just go to vitishouse.com if they're wor- worried about their wine education or they don't know, or, yeah, how do you, how do you get people to come These to your school? These classes and not even the courses, they're not intimidating. We have people from all levels. We have people that love wine, that they want to start into the wine, that they're wine collectors, that they work in the industry. Um, So you have plenty of options. I mean, most of our students, they start with a class and then they ended up doing the certifications. Oh, cool. Yes. There's, I mean, sometimes it's like most of the people are from the industry, but that's not what is happening in North Carolina. And that's the beauty of it. I love it. Mm -hmm. On every class we have people, I don't know, people that retire, people that just want a new hobby. like a... uh, not to be, you know, sexist, like a bunch of ladies could go together as like an afternoon thing to do. Or a bunch of dudes could get together and be like, hey, let's, we were going to drink wine anyway. Why don't we learn a little bit about the wine that we're drinking? And like, that's, it's a social fun thing to do to start. And then if you're kind of into it, then you can continue the process beyond that. Right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you can go to vitishouse.com. And um, you'll find all the classes or the courses. I mean, we also do private events. So if you, have friends or colleagues or um, a group of uh, people from the office and you want to just get together and have a private class, we do that too. So we have plenty of options. I mean, and I'm, I'm a creative person. The other side of me is creative. So I'm all the time like developing a new class right now. There's someone slow cooking called um, Wines from the Bible and it's going to be Wines from Israel and Greece. Oh. Oh, that's going to be a really cool class. Yeah, the Galilee is putting out some interesting <laughs> wines these oh, yes. days, and they're actually, yeah, oh, they're actually yes. pretty good. Like you were saying, uh, you can make wine all over the world, and you think, you know, Israel is like a desert country, but uh, but yeah, I've had some of those wines. They and they're started actually pretty good. there. Yeah, it's right. Like, that's right. They started too, there. So you've got like coastal lands. So. Yeah, you do have some coastal lands, but yeah. it's. Yeah, usually a little uh, in turmoil in that specific spot. Yeah, there's a little, a little war over there's there. There's not a lot of Gaza Strip wineries. <laughs> well, you never know. Um, Hopefully, we can start traveling together for food and wine. That's the goal. Maybe next year. Yeah. To do harvest together or to have experiences, you know. That's yeah. that is the. Yeah, that's the best part about wine. I want before we get out of here, I do want to ask one more thing. Like I, I'm always intrigued because uh, I. I mean, but we mentioned Boricua Sol, um, but they're kind of doing like a Caribbean Latin thing all fused together mm-hmm. uh, with a barbecue or a barbacoa, I guess, uh, aspect to it. What like uh, what what do we need to know that we don't know about Puerto Rican food? Puerto Rican food is totally different to Dominican food. Yeah. To Cuban food. Okay. And to any other food in the Latin it's America. It's exactly the same as Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> it is not. Yeah, no. It's like, come on, Spanish food is not about paella. Um, yeah, so each island, each island is so different, um, especially Cuba. Yeah. Cuba, Cuban cuisine is completely different. They like um, high acid foods. They cook with um, different herbs and a lot of um, um, high in acid oranges, sour orange and lemon and cumin. We don't use that in Puerto Rico, only for okay. ceviche. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I will say Dominican food and Puerto Rican food is a pinch more similar. Okay. Yes. Okay. In general. But um, every island is totally different. It's like when you go to Mexico. I mean, the food in Mexico, in Guadalajara, is completely different to the one in in, in the DF, in the city of, yeah. of Mexico. And it's the same thing in Italy. Like, yeah. you go to the north and you have a cuisine. And you go to the south and you have a different one. Yeah. So, that's the most important thing like i'm very passionate about okay hispanic food or latin food or mediterranean food no that's not the right 
name to call it. Let's call it with a last name. Yeah. <laughs> From where is this? Yeah. And if you're doing a fusion, just just make sure that you're saying that you're you're putting together a fusion. You know. Because well, when when like. N- I think most people think of Puerto Rico, they think of San Juan, but there's a lot of other aspects to Puerto Rico, right? So yes. like, where are you from or where did you grow up in Puerto Rico? I born in San Juan, but I grew up in a town that is like 10 minutes from San Juan. It's called Bayamon. Okay. Actually, the, the most typical dish in Bayamon is the um, the pork, um, the fried pork skin. Okay. We call it chicharron. Yeah. Same as in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but our chicharron is like, like, like two, two feet, two feet wide, <laughs> like, two feet. like that's the, the whole, meal. Yeah, the, the chicharron. No, it's just a snack. Okay, yeah. with bread. Okay. <laughs> oh my god! No wonder why Decadent. you're cooking yes. healthy foods now. You were yeah. raised but on But actually, skin I was in Puerto Rico last week, and I have to say, I mean, each region, even though it's a small island, each region has a has a popular dish. Like you go to the beach, and you have all the 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 African um, recipes of like fritters with roots and filled with um, crab or um, or chicken or pork um, or cod. Then you go to the mountains and you have the lechon that we slow roast the lechon like yeah. Puerto Rican way, not like Cuban way. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, each each area has a has a unique product you know ingredient i gotta get out to puerto rico like seriously like that's gotta happen Matt, Tickets. Let's, let's go go let's the, go yeah let's together. do ncf and be uh puerto rico heck yeah you can do coffee tasting too <laughs> oh, that's right yeah, yeah. we have great coffee, coffee. rum we have great rum yeah yes in ponce yeah uh, the serrayes the don q brand okay. is yep. from there yes have you ever taken rum and uh mixed it with a little uh coconut ice cream oh mm-hmm. and uh put it inside a container <laughs> And labeled it proof alcohol ice cream. Because <laughs> proof alcohol ice cream did. <laughs> they did it. In, uh, in Colombia, South Carolina. <laughs> nice. That's yeah. where they got it I from. see what you did there. See what I did? Uh, before, because we were kind of at the end of our uh, podcast today, before we get out of here, we want to give you a little proof alcohol ice cream because they are also a fantastic sponsor of the podcast. And they made all of us think differently about dessert by fusing fantastic spiritist liquors in with delicious, uh, almost uh, uh, debaucherous ice cream put together 7% ABV in every pint. You can have bourbon caramel. You could have the aforementioned coconut rum. You could do like strawberry moonshine. There's pumpkin and spice. There's so many different flavors. We have a freezer out here in the in the walkway when you first walk into the kitchen that you will go home with. Love you it. you give to somebody or all by yourself. I think Preeti is still walking around the neighborhood just <laughs> scooping it, just eating it as she's walking down the street. Uh, that's what we say. That's what we encourage um, public yeah, uh, ice cream eating. Um, I have to but, say, this is the best podcast interview I ever done in my entire life. I mean, coffee, ice cream with rum. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we aim to please. We, two, two super foodies in front of me. We oh, what a, a three. pig uh, in the other <laughs> office, so we're going to dig that up in a moment. Little conchinita. <laughs> and we actually had a Puerto Rican chef flown in to make some chicharrones for you. I Classic know, way. but next time I have to bring food. I yeah. feel like I'm Seriously. not bringing anything. <laughs> uh, and and one thing, for the for people that are local in this area, uh, Venice House is in the loading dock area, correct? Correct. Yeah, we didn't even talk correct. about that. We yeah. are the loading dock. If you're not familiar with it, it's like next to Lingwood Brewery and Hummingbird Restaurant. Yeah. Uh, um, it's a beautiful classroom that we have at the Loading Dog. Feeling very blessed with the support of the Loading Dogs since, since we started. And that's and you could kill an entire day there. Like you could learn about wine. You could drink some beer. You could go over to Wilson's get a burger. You could like hummingbird to get a smart little cocktail later on. Like there's a lot to do in that that area. Correct. Before and after a class, you have it all. Just walking distance. You don't. You don't think so you don't get in trouble. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, well. Doreen, you didn't have to bring anything. You're wearing your Technicolor dream coat was, uh, and your personality was just, was way more than enough for us. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, for all of you out there that are interested in furthering or beginning your wine education, check out vitishouse.com. That's V-I-T-I-S. And uh, you will learn and drink very merrily. Yes. Thanks for listening to the NCF&B Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged.